It's time for Behind the Hits, where great country songwriters talk about great country songs on today's best country, proudly broadcasting on the American Forces Radio Network. I'm your host, Ty Hager, and my guest this week has been cranking out hits for a couple of decades. I've been thinking about you. I'm running out of reasons to love. I want to be your everything. And I am talking with hit songwriter Bob Regan from his Nashville studio. And uh, Bob, first of all, thank you so much for joining me. Um, uh, proud to be here. Thank you. Let's go ahead and start with where it all began. Uh, you're from California. Um, uh, yes, I'm a native Northern Californian. Um, I call Lake Tahoe home. That's kind of where I went to you know, the last part of school. Um, that's a great place to be from. I like. I wish I was out there right now, since it's about 105 outside. <laughs> I'd like to be in Lake Tahoe right now. Uh, so yeah, I just kind of picked up a guitar many, many years ago, and never had the, you know, the good sense to put it down. So here I am. How did you get started, and what was it that eventually brought you to Music City? Uh, well. I've been doing this for a long while, and back, uh, you know, when I was going through, co- uh, putting myself through college, playing, and, you know, I had a little band around my, I went to University of California at Davis, and I just kind of played around. There were a lot of, a lot of live music venues and fraternity parties, and, uh, you know, just kind of whatever, whatever I could do to make a buck, and I always loved playing and, and singing and just doing it, but I never really thought of it as a career. Uh, and when I finally graduated, I thought, well, I'm going to, playing the band for a couple of years that sounded like fun and i kind of always thought i'd go back to school and you know maybe get some kind of a higher degree and teach or get a law degree or something it was kind of undefined but i started playing and two years dragged into five and dragged into ten and, and then i ended up moving to los angeles and i had a, a recording deal for a little while there in los angeles in the early 80s as a solo artist and uh, i think having a record deal uh it, convinced me that i was not record deal material (laughs) and at that point um i started thinking i might be a songwriter because i've been writing songs for the past several years and all my my songs were were received better than i was as an artist so that was kind of a (laughs) wake-up call and uh but at this point i was you know in my 30s and i was married i had two little kids and then broke and i told my wife at the time i said uh you know let's if you'll if you're willing to give Nashville a shot, give me. Let's. I'll go out there. If I don't, if I can't write a hit in three years, then we'll pack it up and we'll move back to Sacramento and I'll, I'll be a civilian. You know, go back to school or get a job or do whatever normal people do. But I, I was fortunate enough to get a hit song in the first couple of years I was there, and and that was 26 years ago. And and here I remain. I was very very lucky. It was a. You know, it was also the, the business was a a good bit different back then there were more more opportunities that's a you know there still are opportunities but it was was a thing more doors were open back then now i've got this theory and uh tell me if it's it's right as far as uh, your situation goes that most writers that come to nashville have mostly written on their own and it's not until you get to nashville that you really get into the whole co-writing thing uh yes that's absolutely the case i had never co-written a song before i got to nashville and in the the original band i was in and up in northern california everybody wrote songs but it was more like a competition as opposed to a collaboration so anyway i was terrified of co-writing when i got to nashville uh because i was just used to kind of hammering things out on my own and uh i didn't want to I didn't want to reveal my lack of talent to anybody. I didn't want to, you know, sit in front of people that, you know, and, you know, it's it's intimidating. Sometimes you will get to sit down with someone who's written hit songs. I was so hesitant to co-write that I would, if I had a co-write the next day, I would sit up all night and get up early the next day and write three quarters of the song just to bring something in. (laughs) But I, I got over that pretty quick. Once you sit in a room with people, even people who have written brilliant songs, you find that they... You know, we're kind of all in the same boat. You have to just get an idea and start thrashing around, and, and it slowly gets better. Uh, and if you if you get a, in a good, comfortable co-writing situation, everyone is completely open and forgiving and even encouraging of, of people 
to say whatever they're thinking, blurt anything out. Just keep talking, keep throwing ideas out there. Uh, so, and it's also a really cool way to uh, to get instant feedback. Uh, oh yeah, uh, and you know, not not every call writing situation works. You have to get two people that can sort of ag- agree when when a line is not right. You have to agree that you need to keep working on it, and when the line is right, you have to agree that it that it is right, and that doesn't always occur in a co-writing session you know sometimes one co-writer will hear a line and go that's just not strong enough or that doesn't make any sense and the other guy goes no that's you know that's got to be in there um and those co-writing relationships maybe don't last that long and that's not to say any one person is right but you know you can it's just a different dynamic every time you sit down with somebody so what was uh what was the first the first hit that you had that uh that gave you that encouragement to that you had done the right thing? Uh it, it was a song that Reba McIntyre cut and she was a, a big star back then as she is today. She was probably the definitely the biggest female in country and she recorded a song I wrote called Tell Love Comes Again. Um it was a top 5 and uh it kind of led led me to believe that well if I can do it once maybe I can do it again. Uh, and it was, you know, I was, I was very encouraged and uh, business was smaller. It didn't, you know, but now if you write a hit song, you can pay a few bills and, you know, you can actually make a, a pretty good chunk of change. Back then it was maybe 20% of what a, a hit record pays now. So it was not hardly life changing, but it was life affirming at that point. Wow. From 1989, there's Reba, Till Love Comes Again, a tune written by Ed Hill, and my guest this week on Behind the Hits, Bob Regan. But it still must have been cool to uh, come home to the wife and kids and say, uh, guess who's going to cut one of my songs? Uh, Oh yeah, that was good. And really, I mean, for me it was just a, a, a validation because like so many people, you start doing this and you really have to spend a lot of time and you know, all my family and my old friends were kind of looking at me and looking at Bob and kind of shaking their head and go, good Lord, what is he doing out there? And, you know, he played in bars in Sacramento for 10 years and went to L.A. and flamed out as a recording artist. And now he's out in Nashville beating around. So, you know, once once I felt like I had one hit record, at least I had, you know, that I got that card stamped. And, and it was just kind of a validation of the, the 15 years of uh, of work and you know roaming and rambling around the music business and then a few years later a country legend uh tanya tucker made one of your songs the uh the title track yeah that was a a number one song that was uh proud of that song i wrote that with casey kelly and again tanya tucker people may may not know who she is now but she was uh very big stuff back then and it was a kind of an interesting song about a uh a song about from the song from the point of view of a woman who was having an affair with a married man and kind of touchy subject matter but uh i feel like we wrote it well and she did an amazing job and uh, just to hear tanya tucker sing one of your songs you know sing anything much less one of your songs is just a, it's a great thing she was a stylist unlike anybody we've seen since so that was that, that was further validation that i could you know might, might actually have a career looking back she thinks about that moment in the sand Tanya Tucker from 1993 with the title track of her album Soon a tune written by Casey Kelly and my guest this week on Behind the Hits Bob Regan so did it feel like uh it was like a a long ladder that you were climbing uh you know the reba hit was like number four Mm -hmm. uh then you had the number one hit with tanya and then you and tom shapiro got together and wrote a smash for trisha yearwood yep thinking about you that was a a big number one song and again you know trisha's not on the radio much anymore but at the time she was you know probably the top female vocalist so so all that all that was good and I was I was starting to feel you know a little little more confident about things but believe it or not even even then I was still I still working on the Opry on the weekends and still doing the occasional session but I think I was I was starting to wind it down I I could say at this point I, I 
I hadn't had weekends off in my adult life. So when I, when I finally, when I finally quit the Opry, I was in my forties and I hadn't really had a weekend off in 20 years. So to be able to, you know, come home on a weekend and take a trip with my kids and, you know, do what normal people did. It was like, wow, this is really something. And the, uh, the Trisha Yearwood hit thinking about you, uh, that was also, I believe that scraped into the top 20 on the pop chart. Uh, yeah, that got a whole bunch of airplay and, uh, uh, back then CDs sold a lot. So I think that's probably sold, you know, seven or 8 million units all in back when people still bought CDs. All that's good. It's nice to, nice to, you know, get, get the, get the validation. And it's, it's good when it's a song that you really like also is recorded by an artist for whom you have great respect. Not quite sure what's going on. A huge smash from 1995. There's Trisha Yearwood thinking about you. That one went to number one. Also cracked the top 20 of the pop charts. It was Trisha's third number one, written by big-time songwriter Tom Shapiro and my guest, big-time songwriter Bob Regan. You're listening to Behind the Hits on today's Best Country. Proud, honored, and thrilled to be broadcasting on the American Forces Radio Network. I'm your host, Ty Hager. We are talking from his Nashville studio with hit songwriter Bob Regan. So at this point, you're doing pretty well, but let's talk about the ratio of hits to misses. I would probably write anywhere from 75 to 100 songs a year, probably demo 60 songs a year, and if I had... One, one hit a year or one hit every two years, then I was doing extremely well. So even for a songwriter that's, uh, you know, and I I was never in the, I didn't feel like I was in the top tier, but I'm just saying I, I probably had a, you know, 90% of my songs never saw the light of day. So that that's humbling. Even though you do get the occasional success, um, you know, most songs are met with <laughs> a ho-hum, and what else you got? So that that keeps you humble, even in the in the in the face of the occasional success. It's really a numbers game. Well, it's everybody has their own way of doing it. There's some people that write, you know, just a very few songs. I got like a Hugh Prestwood who wrote some wonderful songs for this year. Would writes maybe ten or twelve songs a year, and every one of them is just an unbelievable gem. And probably half of those get recorded. I'm kind of a get up every day and go to the office kind of guy. So every, everybody has their own style. It's what, whatever, whatever works. That's, that's my battle cry is whatever works. And then uh, the next year, after uh, to follow up the Trisha Yearwood big hit, um, you had what turned out to be, thus far, uh, Rick Trevino's only number one tune. Yep, that was uh, Rick's biggest hit. And uh, Rick was a pretty good, uh, pretty good star at that point. Uh, and I wrote that song with George Taron, who was a longtime co-writer of mine. Uh, and yeah, that was, uh, you know, that, that felt good. There was a, a, you know, for a little, a little while there in the, in the nineties and early two thousands, I kind of felt like I was, I was, you know, kind of had, had a little something figured out. It's, you know, the market's always tough and it's, you know, and I would never recommend any songwriter to say, I've got it dialed in. I know what I'm doing. I'm going to hit one out of the park every time. Not the case, but there was a, a, there was a nice little stretch there where uh, things were working. And it's and, and I've done this when it's working, and I've done it when it's not working. And I'm, I'm here to tell you, it's a lot more fun when it's working. There's a long stretch of black time underneath the cloudless sky. Rick Trevino went to number one in 1996 with that one running out of reasons to run a tune co-written by George Terran and my guest this week on Behind the Hits, Bob Regan. You're listening to Behind the Hits, where great country songwriters talk about great country songs on today's Best Country. Proud and honored to be broadcasting on the American Forces Radio Network. I'm your host, Ty Hager, and I want to thank each and every one of our men and women in uniform around the world for keeping us safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Still coming up on Behind the Hit with my guest Bob Regan. We're gonna make ski. I wanna be your everything. Because you've got the the strong songwriting work ethic, I'm curious as to how many times you've gone into a writing session thinking, I absolutely do not feel like writing today, and it's turned out to be something pretty cool. Oh, that happens a good bit. You know, I mean, there's the way most, I've heard a lot of people say, must be present to win. Um, and most songwriters, you know, I mean, I don't want to, make it sound like my work ethic is any more more than uh, any anyone else's almost all the successful people that i've known who've, who've done this for a long stretch really do work hard if you without a strong work ethic you better be incredibly talented you got to show up and, and a lot of people that don't really know how the you know professional songwriting works they say well what do you do do you just wait do you wait till you get inspired and i go no i I try to create an atmosphere in which inspiration will come. Um, now you had kind of a uh, kind of a comeback hit with uh, Billy Ray Cyrus because it was his first uh, top ten in six years in 1999. You and George Terran wrote "Busy Man." Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that was a fun song. I kind of I was proud of that song, and I was proud to kind of bring Billy back. I had uh, George and I both had two kids, a son and a daughter, who were mine were about halfway through high school and his were just in middle school we just were talking about the small window of opportunity that you have to you know when your kids actually want to hang around with you uh so we kind of wrote a song about that because both of us were constantly running around trying to accomplish things and trying not to neglect our families so we wrote that song and it kind of it kind of resonated and i guess at the time billy was his career was in a little bit of a lull, and he'd been home raising Miley. So I, that that worked out pretty good for him. Yeah, I would I would say so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, that that was uh you know I, we we enjoyed that song. It was fun to bring Billy back, and he is just a, a wonderful guy and uh, incredibly warm and, and giving, and uh, he does you know any any number of charity things and just a, a huge heart and what, what you see on tv is exactly what you get there's a little boy out in the driveway from 1999 there's a cool tune from billy ray cyrus busy man went to number three written by george Terran and my guest this week on behind the hits bob regan and i'll tell you what also with uh with billy ray you've got to give him credit we're just hanging in there. Back to the characteristic of the people that end up surviving in this business and sticking around. It's you, you know, you keep going. If one one door closes, you keep beating your head against the wall. And except you can't keep beating your head against the wall in the same place. You got to move to the left or to the right every once in a while. Move to a different a different part of the wall. Yes, you might. There might be a door there or a window. You never know. Well, I'm sure you're not encouraging people to put their heads through windows. Not, not, but look through it, but don't put your head through it. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, about your involvement with NSAI. Yeah, I was uh, president of the board for three years, and I've been the legislative chair of the board for the last uh, uh, maybe five years, and that's not that's not not a not a paid not a paid position. I can assure you. Sure. <laughs> and but you deal with issues that make sure that songwriters get paid. Yeah, this isn't really something that I had anticipated getting involved in. But um, as a lot of people know, starting about you know 2000 with uh, Napster and the, the advent of uh, the internet and you know, illegal peer to peer and just a complete um, rejiggering of the way the music business works and how music is distributed. Uh, bought and sold and paid for hopefully or mostly not paid for so it was really a cataclysmic change for the music industry and uh there was been a lot of um places where copyright law and the internet intersect and i found much to my surprise that representative democracy kind of kind of works we're back to the must be present to win i found that when a lot of these you know, pieces of legislation were being considered that they actually were 
Congress people and their staffs and senators were really happy to hear from working songwriters to see how, you know, uh, the rules of the road on the Internet or the, the lack of rules had been affecting our livelihood. And a lot of our concerns have been addressed, uh, albeit not in a, you know, the light speed that I would like to have seen. But little by little, um, you know, the laws are catching up with uh, the gigantic quantum leaps in technology. And, and I'm guardedly optimistic that we may be seeing a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel and, and get creators uh, and songwriters and musicians and everybody in the musical food chain compensated. Now, is there a, have you guys been able to figure out even a ballpark estimate of how many millions of dollars songwriters have lost since uh, since the advent of downloading? Anytime you legally download something from iTunes, from Amazon, uh, if you use one of the streaming services, there's a new service that just arrived called Spotify, uh, which is ad-based. Um, we get paid. The ones we do not get paid on are the illegal peer-to-peer -peer sites like uh, LimeWire, which they were just sued. It took probably eight years to run them out of business. The guy made a hundred million dollars, and that's one guy in his own pocket. Um, and the, the judgment finally came down, shut him down, and he now has civil damages of a hundred million dollars. You call and wake me up the way you always do. Terry Clark with a tune that went to number 12, also went to number 2 in Canada, Every Time I Cry, co-written by Karen Staley, and my guest this week on Behind the Hits, Bob Regan. And now since we're airing this show to our troops uh, worldwide, as a matter of fact, it's very cool that you have played for our troops quite a bit. One of the more uh, most gratifying things I've done over the last uh several years was uh, I've, I've done a, a whole bunch of tours, tours for Armed Forces Entertainment. And uh, my buddy Tom Shepard, who wrote Riding with Private Malone, he said, my name is Private Andrew Malone. And if you're reading this, then I didn't make it home. And uh, through that, he started doing some tours for the Armed Forces Entertainment. And uh, we put together a little songwriter band of all musicians that wrote songs and then we've gone out and toured we've uh, done uh, a couple tours in the middle east we were scheduled to go to iraq and uh, afghanistan but this was back a few years ago when it got we were in camp virginia ready to go in and the uh, things heated up a, a lot in baghdad and they called it off much to my dismay i'm hoping to get back but we've done that we were in saudi uh, this time last year uh, so I've been through all the Gulf states, Djibouti, uh, we've done Kosovo, been all through Poland, uh, Belarus, Western Europe, a bunch. Um, and I really love, love nothing more than going and playing for the troops, and it's been really inspiring. And uh, every time I talk to service members, I always say thank you. You know, we, we, can't, we can't quit thanking each other. It's kind of, I say, no, thank you, no, thank you, no, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, but anyway, it, it's truly inspiring. And uh, I, any time I get a call to go do that on uh, however long or short a notice, I will, uh, I'll, I'll be there and I'll do it again. And I think the, uh, I think our service members, um, because of the situation that they're in, uh, and the fact that so many of them are such huge country fans, I think that they are a demographic that really, really appreciate the songs themselves. Mm hmm Yeah, it's uh, it, we, we've been really well received, and uh, they they've been incredibly appreciative. Uh, and Tom Shepard and I wrote a song called "Cowboys and Soldiers," which was recorded by this kid Tyler Dickerson he was on a Disney records I'm not sure the album didn't do much but it was a, a song that we wrote after one of the armed forces tours because uh, a lot of these guys if they can if they can get into their civilian clothes they'll come to the show wearing you know their Tony llamas and their hats and their buckles and so we we wrote a song for them called Cowboys and Soldiers Crying on somebody's shoulder Cowboys and Soldiers Another song I wrote that we played over there. It's a, it's 
song called The War After the War that I wrote for my uh, my little niece-in-law, uh, Emily Nelson. Uh, her boyfriend uh, enlisted in the Marines and uh, just he was getting ready to ship out from San Diego and she told her parents she was going to go down, go down and marry him just before he shipped out, which she did, and he was injured in, uh, in Iraq. And so I wrote a song called The War After the War for Ben and Emily that I'm really proud of, and we've played all over the country and all over the world. And uh, pe people seem to like it, and it's been a cathartic song, and I'll, I'll send that one along too, with your permission. And his fight is just beginning but not on some distant shore With the heart of a soldier He'll fight the war after the war And I've got a link to that YouTube video on the website BehindTheHitsRadio.com That's very cool. Well, let's talk about uh, the big hit uh, that was also a title track for Ty Herndon, uh, that song Steam. I remember when the video came out, and I was like, that is a, that's a steamy video. Yes, and as, as hot as it is, um, I just talked to a buddy in Fort Worth that was 110 today, so this, that's apt. Uh, that was just kind of a cool little groove that my buddy Lewis Anderson came up with, and he had the title Steam, and... Uh, we just kind of wrote it and tried to make it as greasy as possible. And Ty Hernan liked it and greased it up a little bit more. And, yeah, the, the video was, was pretty steamy. So that, that was not a huge hit. I think that might have bumped the top ten. Um, but it was uh, that was just a good, fun, groove song. And uh, that was that also fulfilled a dream of mine. I always wanted to see a go to a strip club and see a girl dancing to one of my songs. And that... that <laughs> <laughs> that fulfilled that that fulfilled that wish. Mission accomplished. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a steamy one from Ty Herndon from 1999. Steam, coincidentally, the title track of his album called Uh Steam, co-written by Lewis Anderson and my guest this week on Behind the Hits. Bob Regan. Now, when uh, when you and Chris Lindsay got together and wrote "You're Everything" uh, for Keith Urban, and it ended up being his first top five hit, mm -hmm. uh, did you have any idea how big Keith was going to be? No, um, I was aware of Keith. I knew he was a really talented guy and a great guitar player, and he had had a band called The Ranch. When, when they'd had a couple of songs out where he was just the guitar player and lead singer in a little three-piece band. Um, so we felt like the song was pretty good, but we, and you know, we were, to tell the truth, we were hoping for some big superstar to record it. Uh, we didn't realize he was going to be a superstar. Uh, so that was, that was a nice surprise. But once I, you know, once I heard him do it and saw the video and saw him perform, I went, okay, I think, I think this is going to be, I think this is going to be a good thing. Extremely talented fella, and also I've met him. He's uh, he's he's as laid back and mm -hmm. down to earth as any guy you can meet. Right. Well, he still thinks of himself, even though he really is a you know a superstar and a, and a vocalist. I, he thinks of himself as a musician first. You know, and that and you, you'll find the people like that in the business that think of themselves as musicians first. That's a they're they're the most humble people because. <laughs> A la a Vince Gill or even a Brad Paisley, because if you try to master the guitar, there's nothing more humbling than that. It doesn't matter how many tens of thousands of people are screaming your name in the arena when you get home at night and try to figure out that new riff. The guitar will humble you every time. First time I looked in your eyes, I knew. Keith Urban's first foray into the top five, a big hit called Your Everything, went to number four back in 2000, written by Chris Lindsay, and my guest this week on Behind the Hits, Bob Regan. Well, Bob, I want to thank you so much. Uh, it's been a great conversation. I've really enjoyed listening to your stories. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you so much for having me, and 
Call me anytime. And that's going to wrap it up for Behind the Hits, where great country songwriters talk about great country songs. I want to thank my very special guest, Bob Regan. It's been truly a pleasure. His website is Bob Regan. That's R-E-G-A-N. You know how to spell Bob. If you don't, you're a dummy. Dot com. Behind the Hits is produced by Bass Hackers Productions in association with Jagger Payton Radio online at jaggerpayton.com. Okay, then. Co-produced and engineered by Steve Goody at Pitch Perfect Recording in Nashville. Check them out on the web at pitchperfectrecording.com. Okay, then. Theme music by Rebecca Kraft, produced by Steve Goody. Okay, then. Post-production assistance by Bill Levingston at Automatic Productions. Okay, then. And don't forget to check out our website where you can get my complete songwriter interviews, cool songwriter links, and more. It's BehindTheHitsRadio.com. And now for the legal stuff. Behind the Hits is copyright 2011 Bass Ackwards Productions. Any unauthorized duplication or distribution might sound like fun if you're very easily amused. Any resemblance to persons living or dead would be cool, but any resemblance to persons living and dead would be damn near impossible. No animals were harmed during the making of Behind the Hits, except for Barney. I love you. You love me. Who we beat with a stick. Ah! Uh, good times.